Good morning. Good morning. Um, as you can tell, Dan and Helen are not here. Um, they are in Montreat with the youth, um, and we wish them uh, a wonderful week and hope that they will come back refreshed and renewed. In Dan and Helen's stead, Dr. Paige McWright will be preaching today, and I will be assisting her. Um, I don't know that we have many announcements this week. Um, the church office is closed on Friday, but I think Bonnie McKnight has a minute for mission for us. Had our the Cononia class had their annual scholarship uh, dinner on this past Wednesday night. We had a great time, and uh, with what had already been donated and what we collected, we're up to four thousand seven hundred and eight dollars. We have six recipients this year, so uh, if you haven't given and you would like to, we still welcome your contributions. You may uh, give them to the church office. You may put a check in the. Uh, collection plate, put scholarship dinner, shop scholarship fund on it, or if you want to give cash, you can use one of these and put scholarship fund. Um, we have uh, actually one person got left off the list in the uh, in your bulletin. Thank you. <laughs> I do that all the time. I have a right in front of me and can't think what it is. Um, a list, but uh, Emily Christman, who is the Bogner's granddaughter, was left off. She is also, there's six of us, six of them now. So uh, if you have not uh, had an opportunity to contribute to this very worthy cause, we would appreciate your considering it and helping us out. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, can you join us now in a moment of silence?
Thank you. Please join me in the call to worship. On an ordinary Sunday, we come to worship God. We come trusting God will speak to us. We come hoping God will surprise us. On this day, like every other day, we seek to follow Jesus. We follow believing Jesus will be with us. We follow hoping Jesus will work through us. On this day, we lift our souls to God's Spirit. We open our hearts that the Spirit may fill us. We open our hands that we might be a gift to others. Thank you. Holy, holy, holy God, all the earth is full of your majesty. The lightning flash is a sign of your creative voice. Thunder resounds with the magnitude of your power and strength. The rains fall as a reminder of your gentle refreshment. The sun shines in testimony to the warmth of your love. All creation is your temple. None can hide from you. Exposed to your grandeur and led by your spirit, we give you all praise and honor, God of our lives. Amen. Please. Scripture reading is Psalm 1. It is located on page 463 in your Pew Bible. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, 
but the way of the wicked will perish. Thanks be to God. Please join me now in the call to confession. We live our lives tiptoeing around the facts that we often say, words we should never have uttered. We do those things we wish we could take back. Yet God would reach out to take us by the hand, so we walk together toward waters of grace. Let us offer our hearts and our brokenness to our God, who offers us mercy in these moments. From the basements of our lives, we lift our prayers to you, loving God. We are convinced we know who our sisters and brothers are, and so ignore those you long for us to embrace. Someone told us once that we had faults, and so we try to live up to their expectations. We are so intent on watching for all that could go wrong, we miss your hope rising just over the horizon. If you kept a spreadsheet of our foolishness, creator of your family, we would hardly be worthy. But you do not let our mistakes distract you from walking with us in every moment. And so we hear you calling us by name and welcoming us into your family of faith as we seek to follow Jesus Christ, our brother, into reaching out to all around us. Hope in God, dear friends, for the one who listens to our prayers is the God who loves us. The one who knows our foolish lives better than we do is the God who forgives us. This indeed is for us. Even when we stumble, God will reach out to steady us. Even when we fall, God will pick us up. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Amen. I'd like to welcome the children forward. Do we have any children today? Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. From Ireland. 
Carolyn, welcome. We're glad to have you. Thank you. And I feel like you guys are my support group. Thank you for coming up. Um, <laughs> so today we have um, Paige, is, Dr. McWright is sitting in for Dan and Helen. And I wanted to share with you guys something before we talk about one of the things she's doing. So will you hold that, Rebecca? Please hold that. There you go. You can see I'm old school. I brought albums. OK. You guys can pass these. Yeah, they're really old. And they might fall out, which is okay. It's okay if they fall out. You can pass these down. Thank you. Okay. So tell me what, um, we're going to start with Don. What, what do you have? What? What's the, what is this? Read, just read it. The best of the Almond Brothers Band. Okay. All right. Okay. What do you have, Rebecca? The very best of, is it future or just the, no, of the future? The Ventures. Oh, sorry. Okay. All right. What do you guys have? What do we have? Uh, the best of Nat King Cole. I'll say that. The best of Nat King Cole. I told you I'm an old soul. Okay. Do you know what this says? It's in a weird, it's in weird writing. What does that say? It's the, what does it say? The greatest hits of the Eagles. Okay. Can you read that? Yep. The best of the Robert, Roberta Flack. Very good. And you'll get to listen to it later. Um, <laughs> so anyway, what I, the re, you may wonder why I brought these here. So these are greatest hits albums or albums that are collections of the best and most popular songs from these artists, okay? And um, as old as they are, they're also treasured memories, and they bring back lots of memories. If you listen to a greatest hits album or some of the most popular songs from your childhood, you'll get this one day. It'll bring back a lot of memories, okay? So this summer, pastors have been asked to preach some of their favorite sermons. And I was thinking that those are kind of like greatest hits, right? I don't know if their favorite, and we can ask Dr. McWright about this later, if they're her favorite sermon because it was something that went over really well with the congregation, or she just loves the message and wants to repeat it. So I was thinking about Bible stories, and I want to ask you guys if you have a favorite Bible story, something that's a greatest hit for you guys, okay? And there's some wonderful stories in the Bible, lots of them. So I was thinking about it myself yesterday. I love the story of Noah and the ark and putting all, if you can only imagine all the animals on the ark and the time that Noah took to build the ark. And I also love the story of Moses leading the people out of Egypt, right? Great story. Red Sea parts, come on, it's all the drama, that's great. One of my favorites though, that I think has always been a favorite since I was a little kid, was the story of Jonah and the whale. Do you guys remember that? I won't tell the whole, you remember it? Good, I won't tell the whole story, but just the idea of disobeying God, running away from what God asked him to do, and then getting on a boat, and the, a terrible storm came up, and Jonah, at least he did a solid by doing this. When the sailor said, what the heck is going on? He said, look, it's my fault. God sent this storm, throw me overboard. And they did. And he was swallowed by, remember? What was it? A whale. Right, a whale, or some, some versions say a big fish. It must have been a very big fish. So, and he lived inside for three days praying. I'm sure he was praying, please spit me out, right? <laughs> but anyway, and he does, and the fish spits him out, and he goes and does what God originally asked him to do. So I'm going to go around. Does um, Rebecca, you want to tell me, do you have a favorite story, Bible story? I'm trying to choose one. There's just so many good ones. Yeah. Maybe Esther or Ruth? Oh. Yeah, did you hear her? She said Esther and Ruth. That's a wonderful story. I was reviewing that this morning, thinking about it. How about you? Do you have a favorite? Uh, that would be Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark. What, what do you love about it? Uh, 
I guess the animals. <laughs> well, true, right? Imagine that. Anybody else, you guys? First Christmas. First Christmas, for sure. Did you hear her? First Christmas. That's a great story. And if you can't think of one, that's okay. But I want to ask you. Zacchaeus. 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 Yes, that's a great story. How about you? My favorite would be when Moses led the, when Moses led the people out of, what you call the place, was it? Egypt, yeah. And I love his accents. He's going to be my helper. <laughs> love it. Anyway, so those are wonderful stories and things that we can look back on and draw on and reflect on. So I, that's, it's fun. They're kind of like the Bible's greatest hits, but there's a lot more there. So you can explore and go back and look and think about what stories mean the most to you. Okay? Would you like to join me in prayer? Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us all together today to worship and celebrate your love. We hope that we will remember these stories and, have, and they will guide us day to day as we go through the week and our summer months. Thank you for bringing our friends from Ireland and hope that they have a wonderful visit here as well. Amen. So I'll take them back. from the Bible. Will you all pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for your word, which comes to us fresh every morning, inspiring and instructing our lives. As we turn to it now, we pray that you will silence in us any voice but your own, so that your words speak not only to our ears, but also to our hearts, to shape our faith and our lives through Christ our Lord. Amen. So the second text from, for this morning comes from 2 Peter, the first chapter, beginning to read at the second verse. And if you've not turned to, sec, to 1 Peter very often, and to 2 Peter very often, to either of them very often, it's near the back. May grace and peace be yours in abundance in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything needed for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Thus he has given us through these things his precious and very great promises, so that through them you might escape from the corruption that is in the world because of lust, and may become participants of the divine nature. For this very reason you must make every effort to support your faith with goodness, and goodness with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with endurance, and endurance with godliness, and godliness with mutual affection, and mutual affection with love. For if these things are yours and are increasing among you, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Actually, when Helen asked me to preach this morning, she said I would be kicking off a series that Dan and Helen are calling the sermons we've always wanted to preach. And that's what this is. If I were to pick my favorite sermon, it might be the one that's earned me the most money, which is probably the sermon I've preached at People's Ordination. I think I've preached that more than any other. Or it might be a Christmas sermon or an Easter sermon they are the, the, they are the greatest hits in the seasons of the church year. But this one, I picked for a different reason. When I, when I picked it, Will asked me to choose hymns to go with it, and I noticed that I was choosing hymns from an earlier chapter in my ministry, a time when people in our society had a great, greater degree of respect for the place of the church in public life. When these hymns were written, the first and last ones, I'm not talking about the one we just sang, which I know was written in 2008 and is a great hymn and I love it. But the other two were written in the 70s and 80s. 
It was a time when most newspapers still had religion editors and were actually printed. It was a time when few people asked how it is the business of the church to be involved in social justice. After all, highly respected preachers were leaders in the civil rights and anti-war movements, and nobody much said that they thought it was all that odd. It was before the evangelical movement took center stage in the Protestant part of the church. It was a different time. But my love of a part of this text that I just read to you from Second Peter goes back even further. I first heard it during my freshman year at Agnes Scott College. The traditions we remember from our college days are precious. Our memories are as individual as we are, but one thing that all the alumni of Agnes Scott share is a portion of a verse from 2 Peter that is engraved on our college seal. That's why I chose to preach on this text. I preached it in April at my 50th college reunion because I wanted to take a hard look at the, what the words meant and to share what I discovered with my sister alums. I chose the psalm to go with it because I fondly remember my college president reading it to us at least once a year at mandatory Wednesday chapel. The mandatory part, thankfully, has gone by the board. The two texts seem to me to reinforce each other in calling us to be careful in shaping our lives. Wednesday night at the Koinonia dinner, as I heard from my college-age friends about how their year had gone, I was especially glad that I had chosen to preach this sermon today while they are home because they reminded me that those experiences we have when we are young adults right out of high school are so important in shaping our lives. Dr. Edward McNair, a professor at Agnes Scott when I was a student there, wrote a book on the history of the college. In it, he noted that the shaping of the college seal is shrouded in mystery, and he gave no indication of why the verse from 2 Peter was added to the seal in 1908. There may be people who know who chose that verse and why, but for me, that knowledge is still shrouded in mystery, and frankly, that's fine with me. The words on the seal are, add to your faith virtue and to virtue, knowledge. It's always sounded to me like something I might stitch in counted cross stitch and frame and hang on a wall. But I figured there had to be more to it. The admonition to add to faith virtue and to virtue knowledge has always seemed to me really good advice to guide students in a school founded by Presbyterian elders for the education of their daughters. Even by the time I was the chaplain at Agnes Scott, the counsel to add to faith virtue and to virtue knowledge seemed to fit, at least to those students who made up the Religious Life Council. Students who came from a variety of faith traditions and practices, Christians of all stripes, Muslim students, Buddhist students, and those African American students who added to their faith the practices of Kwanzaa. Those students taught me to pay careful attention to my job as their chaplain, to help them in nurturing their faith during their college years. I well remember the Roman Catholic members of the class of 98 who appeared in my office unannounced in their freshman year to tell me that they loved that I was their chaplain and that they knew it was in part my job to see that they got a ride to Mass every Sunday night at the Catholic Chapel at Emory, because that's what they were, thank you very much. As they and the other students on the Religious Life Council planned with me for the year's monthly chapel services, we knew that we all shared a common commitment to the words of the seal, even though our faith traditions were not the same. I should tell you, we had chapel every Sunday night when people got back from the weekend. But monthly, chapel was required. I don't know if you've ever spent much time with Second Peter. 
I don't think I had ever read any of it before I went to college and was introduced to chapter 1, verse 5, and I grew up in a preacher's house. Second Peter only appears in the church calendar as a text for worship twice every three years. Once on Transfiguration Sunday. And that makes sense because the writer talks about being present at the Transfiguration in the first chapter as he stakes his claim to having authority to tell people the truth. It appears once for Advent in the third chapter as he makes his argument against those who were spreading the fake news that Jesus wasn't coming back. We don't really know who the author of this letter was. He claims to be the apostle Peter, but his Greek is way too good for a first century Jewish fisherman. And his reference is to the letters of Paul and controversies in the life of the church that didn't crop up really until after Peter was crucified strongly suggest that this writer was doing what was common in his day, and that is attributing his letter to one of the apostles whose follower he was. Another clue that the authorship is after Peter's death is that the writer practically lifts whole a chapter from the book of Jude and makes it the second chapter of his book. Now, you don't have to go all the way to college to know that plagiarism is a bad thing. However, in the first and second century church, it was a way of claiming solid alignment with the Christian tradition, just as in the same way people lifted parts of the prophets to make their point and their preaching. In short, in looking into 2 Peter in preparation for preaching on it, I found out that this letter is as shrouded in mystery as my college seal is. Strange, but fine. The verse on the seal is good counsel for shaking a life. I've always thought that. It's such good counsel that it deserves more than to be taken out of context and cross-stitched or quoted as a maxim which way too many people, in my opinion, do with way too much of the Bible today and always have. I read to you from the New Revised Standard Version on purpose, and on purpose I read the verse in its context. Even in the translation of verse 5, the differences between what's on my college seal and what's in my Bible are striking. The context of the verse makes it much richer than I ever thought it was when I was a student. The faith Peter is talking about is a gift of God, who has given us everything we need for life and godliness, as the writer tells us in verse 3. It's not something we own, can claim for ourselves, and thus take pride in. It's a gift of God to shape our lives as members of God's kingdom right here and now on earth. People call to be witnesses to others of God's love. To that gift of faith that God gives us, we are to add virtue or goodness, depending on your translation. The Greek word that we translate in various ways had so many meanings by New Testament times that it was impossible to figure out what it meant without taking it in context. It might mean eminence, excellent achievement, It might mean martial valor, a warrior's claim. It might mean merit, like having one's name inscribed on a plaque or being inducted into Phi Beta Kappa or any of those honors that one might get. As adopted by Greek-speaking Jews and early Christians, it came to mean the goodness or self-declaration of God. The goodness which we are called to add to faith is goodness which we know through God, who called us by God's own glory and goodness. The goodness of verse 5 is also defined by verse 3. So if you found 2 Peter and read along with me and still have your Bible open, you can check that out for yourselves. 
We're not called, the point is, we're not called to some kind of goody two-shoes virtue that sets us apart as better than other people, but to support our faith by taking on to ourselves and reflecting the very goodness of God. That brings us to knowledge. In the time of the writer of 2 Peter, there were many who valued knowledge for its own sake. To know things was seen as a high virtue and a high status symbol. Peter cautions his audience to support faith and goodness with knowledge. There surely is a place for a high standard of scholarship. This passage reminds us that scholarship is not in opposition to faith, but in support of it. These qualities are the beginning of a whole list of traits Peter wants for his audience. Traits of self-control and endurance and godliness. Traits that end with mutual affection and the kind of love that is itself a gift and characteristic of the nature of God. Agape in the Greek. This passage from 2 Peter gives us a strong foundation for shaping a life of meaning and service. It reminds us that much of what shapes our lives comes as a gift from outside ourselves, often shrouded in mystery. We are called to live life not for ourselves alone, but in community with others, to never be satisfied with ignorance or easy answers, but to seek understanding so that we can better serve the calling we have been given. We live in a time where people are quick to seek security and simple answers, to choose up sides and fight. As Christians, we are called to lives of faith beyond ourselves, to goodness that seeks the welfare of others as people who serve, using the riches of what we know in support of faith and goodness, and finally, to seek understanding based in love, not protective, easy answers based in fear. It's a countercultural notion in our time. But those of us who graduated 50 years ago this spring came of age when people were protesting for civil rights and against war, not just the one in Vietnam, but the exercise of military might against those who differed from us, ever. As seniors, we witnessed the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. in April and in June of Robert Kennedy. We learned early that simple solutions to the problem of people whose values are different from our own can produce tragic results. All who put their trust in Christ get lives shaped by values that make for rich and meaningful service in the complex world in which we live, and lives that make a difference for that world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please join with me in the affirmation of faith using that section of a brief statement of faith, which is an insert in your bulletin behind the, the announcements. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated and pray with me. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of life in community. We thank you that you call us to be your own and that you give us your word and meaningful work to do. We pray your blessing on all those who are absent from us today so that their faith may be enriched through participation 
in the youth conference at Montreat, that their lives may be refreshed through vacation. We thank you for Logan's life, who joined us so recently, and pray your blessing on him all his days. You who welcome little children, we pray that you will hold them all close, especially those who are separated from their families for any reason. Lord Jesus, you came to this earth poor, a refugee who fled with your family to escape violence. Help us to see you in each other, especially in those who right this minute are on the run looking for safety. Lord Christ, who goes after lost sheep and brings them safely home, make us good shepherds too. We remember this morning all those in our number who are ill and all those who are in our hearts who are ill and pray your healing mercy. We remember those who mourn, especially those families who are mourning the suicides this week of famous people and pray your comfort. And for those whose minds have been stirred to think of suicide by the deaths of the famous and affluent, we pray the assurance of your care, of your love, of your presence made real to them in the presence of people who reach out and help them find a different choice. O oh Lord, this is your world. And as leaders of nations gather to talk about ways to keep it safe, we pray that you will guide their thoughts and their deliberations. And we pray for your church in this and every place that we may truly be what you call us to be, witnesses and agents of your love and of your peace. All this we pray through him who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And protect us from temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Now let us continue our worship as we bring our gifts, our tithes, and offerings.
to live so that those whose lives touch yours know something of the love and mercy of God. And grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit go with you now and remain with you always. Amen.